Welcome to our third video in a series on Christian theology. We have a lot to cover. And so before we jump in, I just want to mention as you watch this video, if you need to take a break, there's in the description hyperlinks with chapters that can explain how to move around the content of today's video so that you can watch it in more bite-sized chunks, or you can go all the way through. Uh, this video series is part of a Bible reading plan with Anthem Church. We're covering 10 key doctrines, emphasizing a systematic approach, looking at the essential scriptures, but also including some historical and biblical theology as well, just to inform our conclusions. And so for today, my objective is to introduce you to the Christian belief of God. We're going to explore some tensions and then defining, not limiting, but really trying to understand who God is and what has he done, and really by what he has revealed to us in the scriptures. And so my goal is to give you some thoughtful explanation, some background, some categories that can really frame your further study on this really important topic. And so whether you're watching these videos uh, as standalone videos or you're following the reading plan or you're going to be part of a group to discuss this, I really hope that this content really deepens your knowledge of God, but not so that you merely know, know more information about God, but to also grow in your relationship with him as well. Just want to recognize the voices that have really shaped uh, just my study of this and preparation. Uh, my professors at Multnomah Biblical Seminaries, particularly uh, Daniel Lockwood and uh, Dr. Metzger, they've been some really key voices in shaping this content. And so I'm just grateful for them. You know, as a kid, I grew up going to church. So I knew many stories about God and the Bible and joined my parents in expressing a level of faith in him. Uh, it wasn't until after my father was killed and I was in high school that my, my faith really became a real decision for me. Uh, not immediately, but my faith was being tested as I confronted uh, what I really believed about God. And I had this choice to either deny God because of this horrible suffering that we went through, which I was honestly so angry about uh, towards God, or to really hold on to my faith in him because I knew in my heart that God was real, uh, which was evident to me as I looked out into the complexity and the beauty of this world, the creation that we exist in, and which became more and more real to me over the years as I realized how much God had given me in my family and the close friends that I have at church. And it's really that they became a testimony to me just really of God's care and, and active care. And, and so even though, you know, I, I struggled, I knew God was there and I knew that he had given me these good gifts uh, that was from him. And so my, my struggle though, wasn't in the knowledge of God as much as the idea of trusting God. That, that became hard for me because I struggled to understand how a loving God allowed these events to really transpire that led to the loss of my hero, the loss of my dad. And so this is what was taken from me. Here's a picture of me and my dad just carving a pumpkin, just these memories that you uh, aren't able to continue to build together. It really took a lifetime for me to process through and really to come to a point where I can sincerely express a true faith in God. But how does that develop? Well, since this difficult time in my story, even though I knew how God was real uh, amidst the pain that I was experiencing, I also understood how God's love for me was stronger. You know, God was and is sovereign over my life, but it was his love, how he entered my pain through the people that he led into my world, through the ways that he was becoming real to me in the person of Jesus you know, God entered my suffering. He entered my questions and my doubts so that I could experience his true abiding love through a relationship to him. He revealed himself to me in the person and work of Jesus. And in time, it was Jesus that redefined my view of God by reframing how I understood God's character and activity in my life. 
Now, this doesn't mean that I didn't struggle uh, or doubt that those things happen. Uh, most days were and most days are today just a mix of good and hard moments, but I chose to see how God loved me like my mom. She was really there for me and cared for me, and it was because of her faith. And so God was uh, being good to us. Uh, he was providing his gracious provision in, in my life, whether it was a relationship with my mom or as, was as ordinary as a warm cup of coffee in the morning or as extraordinary as the many people who expressed kindness to us and embodied God's love towards us, reminding us how every day in, in our life is a gift from God. And so from what I've learned in that time, I'm, I'm really on this journey of faith, stepping forward with Jesus, facing the hard, but focusing on his grace, his, his gifts towards us. And, and through that, able to trust in him and his plan uh, for my life. So that's a bit about my story, but what about you? Who is God to you? And like me, how has your life experience shaped your view of God? Maybe some of your questions. Maybe it's it's affected your confidence or struggle in him. I think of uh, Life Magazine's Who is God issue. They quoted a, a woman, Linda, and she was retelling her struggle of believing God amidst the devastation she experienced from uh, an abortion. But also she described how she found healing from the birth of her daughter. And this is what she said. She said, I do believe in God, but I don't know how to be a Jew. And I don't even know what my soul is. So I can't make a connection to God. And it's really a hopeless feeling that I'm all on my own. It's been that way for 20 years. I'd just like to know for one day what it feels like to hand your life over to God and say, whatever will be, I accept. Now, I know personally how when faced with significant tragedy, it makes faith in a higher power really difficult. And so for many... They can struggle with the idea of God and get to a point where it's just too hard and they've had enough and decide to believe with some level of certainty that there is no God or that there just can't be a God, rejecting him entirely. And I can understand how people would deal with pain in that way. Yet many, like Linda, amidst both the extreme hardships and the blessings of life, uh, still believe in the reality of a God, or maybe you call it a higher power, but don't know what to expect or even what to do in response. You know, sometimes we're left with questions and, and it can make you feel disconnected, alone, and without hope. But still, you know and you believe there's this higher power to at least recognize. And, and so many people are pursuing a spirituality or just a connection with the divine and so as you're working through that, though, you know, left to yourself, you know, your view of God would in time become a bit more of a of a humanistic perspective of God and and the world. And and that's where mankind becomes the measure of all things. And, and in that kind of view, the idea of a creator would likely be only as necessary as God is beneficial for humanity. Now, I just want to make a comment, too, that maybe when you hear this language of God as a hymn, you know, maybe you're still kind of exploring faith and, and, and you're uncertain about, about that. For me as a Christian, the primary reference of God in the Bible is as a father. And so that's how I'm going to be describing God as a hymn. Regardless, in this posture towards God of, of seeing it through the lens of, of our experience, people would likely see God as operating at a totally different plane, you know, beyond this world and where humanity is left alone, being subject to their own decisions and making their own destiny. Destiny, But man, that sounds really hard, spiritually lonely. And yet for other people like Linda, <clears throat> they reject that, uh, kind of that humanistic perspective and believe that mankind was enlightened at some point in time 
by a power or a spiritual being greater than themselves. And so we have these religions like, like Islam, where the prophet Muhammad claimed that the Quran is God's word and guides believers through, you know, these five pillars to honor God and so that he blesses them. And you also think about, you know, Buddhism, where people believe there once was a prince who was enlightened and provides these meditation practices and guidance to lead humanity to do good, to stop evil, and to embrace, embrace all of life amidst the suffering in our world. Now, as people try to make sense of this world, whether looking inside themselves or looking beyond themselves, like to a religion, my belief is that these are all just a form of a, of a man-centered response, focused more on you know, what we do or don't do, maybe to appease God, or is just focused on what we do to create a better reality for ourselves through these spiritual practices that are, are helpful. Uh, yet, as a Christian, our belief in God, <clears throat> it doesn't start with us. God is not found in our best efforts to make sense of him or for us to try to appease him. It's not how the Christian God works. Rather, our belief in God starts with him as a transcendent creator God who was and is powerful enough to enter into the questions, the tension, the mess of our world to directly engage with us in creation and to reveal himself so that we encounter him in the person and work of Jesus. And it's him who we believe is the best source of knowing the reality of the true God. And it is this, you might call it a relational and an incarnational that he entered in, uh, this relational incarnational view of God in the person of Jesus that not only shapes our expectation of who God is and what he does, but it also gives us a depth and a reason to also then shape our view of ourselves as a humanity, because we are made in the image of our relational incarnational God. And so Jesus meets us where we're at so that we know God and ourselves. Now, for many Christians, the unfortunate reality, and, and this is my concern for the church, is how their experience in life can take precedent to, to really reshape their Christian beliefs, which then creates a distorted image of God where, for example, maybe they see him more like a Santa Claus who exists for their benefit. And so you're praying to him, you know, and you believe that he's going to answer you because he's just the guy that gives good gifts, you know, and you have a hard time processing through the difficulty that you might be experiencing. Or maybe they see him more like a, a nice grandpa, you know, who they know that that he's caring but he's also too impotent. He's too weak to really address the problems in the world that they see. Or maybe he's just a cosmic mind who exists and is sovereign over creation, but still feels distant and, and really disconnected from the world and their situation. And so this is why we need to do the work of studying the revelation of God in the Bible. It's to reshape our view of the Christian God, not to let our culture, our traditions, our experiences, and our desires to become the practical, authoritative source of what shapes a distorted view of God. It needs to come from the scriptures. And so remember that God wants us to know him. And so he's part of this with us. He's revealing himself through his word, through Jesus, through creation, making himself known to us. And, and it's with his spirit that, that is guiding us through this process. And so all of this to say is I'm here to really help you take a step forward. I want you to form a more coherent Christian belief about who God is and what he has done as revealed in the Bible. And it's more than just acquiring a view about God. I really want us to, to know who God is and as he is revealed to us in the scriptures so that we can grow in a genuine spiritual relationship to him. Because as a Christian, we believe that knowing God helps us to know ourselves. This is a quote from A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, really appreciate his insight into this. He says, we can never know who or what we are until we know at least something of what God is. God honored mankind above all other beings by creating him in his own image. And so I think of it like with my kids. 
you know, just as a son or daughter learns more about themselves in relationship to their parent, so too does humanity learn more about their true self in relationship to God. And it's he who designed us with an identity and a purpose that's in relation to his character and his plan for the world. So we really want to look to God to, to understand who we are in relationship to him. And so today's goals, there's four really important categories that I want to cover. And uh, this is really to understand who God is and what he's done. And it's, and it's a survey. It's not going to go in depth, but we're going to cover a lot in a little bit of time. And so first we're going to start with uh, how to know God exists and really explore the traditional arguments for the existence of God. Uh, second, we're going to look at a range of views that we can hold both in the world. So looking at different kind of religions, but then also within Christian tradition, just kind of the scope of different views of God. And, and it's, it's looking at some of the tensions of, you know, knowing a transcendent God who's come near to us is actively involved in the world. So we're going to look at that together, try to make some uh, just find clarity uh, in that tension. And then after that, we're going to look at some scriptures to see uh, the attributes of God and his characteristics. And then we'll, we'll finish with uh, kind of the key distinction of the Christian view of God, which is that he is of a triune nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's called the Trinity. And, uh, and so we're going to look at, you know, why does that matter to us? And, and how do we know that from the scriptures? And so let's jump in, and we're going to start by surveying the traditional arguments for the existence of God. So how do we know God exists? Now, as we look at the beginning of the Bible, we see how there's this assumption of God's existence. And so the Bible was not concerned with providing proof of God's existence. We see this in Genesis 1.1 and how the scriptures begin by clearly affirming that the God of the Bible is the creator of all life, but without proof. And so the author assumes the reader believes in the existence of God. Now, as we look to other scriptures, like in Psalm 14, 1, David does argue how people are foolish for living as if there is no God. And so the Bible does give an indictment against those who do not believe in God. But why? You know, what proof did they rely on? What was David looking to, particularly in the Old Testament? Well, David clearly saw God's existence in creation. You can see that by what he wrote in, in passages like Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so it's talking about how creation speaks of God. And so the Bible did point to creation as proof of God's existence, and so let's look at an approach to the question of God's existence as we look to creation. Now, as we approach this question from creation, there's really two starting points, reason and experience. And so when we start with reason, we argue directly for the existence of God, such as what's called the ontological argument. And this was first formulated by an early church leader named Anselm. And it's essentially three beliefs that build on each other. God is a being from which none greater can be conceived. Number two, to be the greatest means God must necessarily exist. Number three, God exists. He necessarily exists. Now, critics have pointed out how this is akin to circular reasoning and how thinking about something doesn't necessarily mean it exists, but that's that's the whole point is it's a a rational, logical argument. And so it is clever and it is reasonable, but I can see how it is insufficient. I do appreciate the thoughtfulness of this explanation from the source of reason. Now you can explain from experience. And so we're going to look at that next. And when you argue from experience, you know, in contrast to reason, you're, you're looking at the facts and then reasoning towards God. And so Paul is best known for this in Romans 1.20, when he argued with evidence from nature, looking at the facts of our world and determining what cause is sufficient to explain the world as we see it. And he says it's God. 
So it's within this approach to the question of God's existence that there's really three common arguments. Now, the first one is known as a cosmological argument, and it explains this from the existence of a vast universe. You know, think about being outside, uh, seeing the stars, and just how overwhelmed you can be. That's what we're talking about. And it's, it's to say that, you know, how, how can that come together but by a powerful God? Only a powerful God could be responsible for such vastness beyond measure. Now, this helps us see that God is powerful, but it doesn't argue for other aspects of God, like him being personal. And so let's continue into the next argument of three. The next one is the teleological argument, and it explains from design and how such an intricate and interconnected world with structure built into it. I mean, these pieces fitting so well together, it would really require an, an intelligent source, which is God. Now, that's the belief God is intelligent because an intelligent God would create such an intricate creation. And uh, while it can reveal, you know, God's wisdom, his purpose, it does not prove that he is good. And so that's the next argument, the final one from experience, the anthropological argument, which explains from human nature and how a complex personal and moral creature would be best explained as coming from a similar but more powerful origin or a God who is also complex, personal, and moral. And so while this argument can explain humanity's inner need for right and wrong, you know, morality, as well as our connection to the, to the divine and how we long to worship a God who's beyond ourselves, it still does not argue for a Christian God specifically. And so creation by itself does not reveal to us how God's standard of morality is established by a loving God, as was revealed to us in Jesus, which is just to say uh, how important it is to have the revelation of Jesus so essential to reveal uh, how our God is a loving God. But these are very helpful, and I, I appreciated uh, C.S. Lewis and his comments on this. He was a, an atheist turned uh, Christian. And uh, he once said, you know, it's very difficult to produce arguments on the popular level for the existence of God. And he seems to believe that many are invalid even. However, he also said, yet nearly everyone I know who has embraced Christianity in adult life has been influenced by what seemed to him to be at least probable arguments for theism. So we can find evidence of God in creation, but there are limits to what these arguments can produce in a person. So we should, in my opinion, be careful to avoid arguing for the existence of God, but rather just let creation speak for itself. Now, as we begin to explore a Christian theology, I want to first highlight the alternatives to biblical theism, and then I want to provide a brief summary of the contemporary views of God within biblical theism. So this will give you a scope of the different perspectives for how the world and then how Christianity views God. And so here are the nine alternatives to biblical theism, which are listed to help you see a comprehensive perspective of the vast array of theistic options available in our world. Now, I want to say before I make some comments on these views, I want to acknowledge that I know a lot of kind-hearted, really intelligent friends, neighbors, and family who hold to many of these views. And so as I make these comments, I acknowledge that much more needs to be said in conversation with people who actually hold these views, and so that they can provide an adequate understanding of their convictions behind their beliefs about God or that they don't believe in God. And so at the same time, when I think about their perspective of this conversation, I also want to be able to start a conversation. So see my brief comments as just that. I'm just starting a conversation with those who hold to these views of God. And so with that, let's begin with atheism. Now, the literal definition is a person who believes there is no God, no observable, no verifiable evidence in this world of God's existence. Now, my challenge with this view is how it assumes the burden of proof to demonstrate with certainty that there is no God, which means this position assumes they know enough of everything 
to believe in the absence of God. Yet the existence of God has not been disproved. Philosophy, psychology, and science have all been unable to prove that there is no God. Yes, belief in God requires faith. It requires trust in a spiritual higher power. But that does not mean that we do not have reasonable evidence to believe that he is there. This is what we were just explaining with these arguments for the existence of a God. And it does not mean an atheist lacks faith, but rather it just means that their object of faith is not in God, it's in humanity, which for me, I find personally more problematic because when I think of the division, the struggles and the hardships from our own brokenness as humans, it's hard for me to put trust in humanity like that. And then finally, remember that Christianity is not a blind faith. It's built upon the testimony of the eyewitnesses of Jesus. And, and we believe Jesus is God incarnate, making God visible to humanity. Now, within this broad category of atheism, there's different forms like humanism, which I highlighted earlier. That's where man uh, mankind is a measure of all things. And then there's naturalism, which is the belief that everything arises from natural causes and therefore it discounts a supernatural explanation to life. And then there's existentialism, which is a bit more of a philosophy, but it believes that humans are free of God and find meaning in the act of making autonomous choices separate from God. Now, a close cousin to atheism is agnosticism, which is someone that would say, I don't know if there is a God. And so for many practical atheists, they actually prefer to call themselves an, an agnostic. And that's where they neither claim faith nor disbelief in God. They, they believe ultimate reality is unknown or just probably unknowable, which means for me, this position is choosing to not choose. And so I would challenge them to look at the evidence and make a decision for themselves, but to, to not live in that gray area, just to not know, but look at the evidence, make a decision. Now, if you want to learn more how to engage in meaningful dialogue <clears throat> with those who do not believe in God, I, I'd also encourage you to read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. This is so important because uh, statistics out there say that about a third of U.S. adults, it's a growing number, describe themselves as an atheist, an agnostic, or nothing in particularly. People call that the nuns. It's uh, I've heard the fastest growing group, uh, call it a religious group, but uh, I'd encourage you to read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. He was an Oxford professor who claimed to have converted from atheism to Christianity, and, and this work explains and defends his reasoning for Christianity. It's, it's intelligent, it's charming, and I found it does a really good job of building a bridge for meaningful conversation between Christians and those who do not believe in God. And so let's move from the two views that do not believe in God or don't know to believe in God to the alternative views uh, that do. And starting with polytheism, this believes in many gods. And so an example of this would be like animism, which associates spirits with objects, you know, as in uh, different gods inhabit the natural world. You might think of it like there's a God in the rock or the tree or the, or the water uh, we see this belief expressed in Native American, African, Indigenous cultures. And uh, so this is a person who believes in many gods. Uh, similarly, this is uh, one that believes in many gods, but with one that is supreme. You can think of uh, Greek, the Greek system of the gods with Zeus being the supreme being. This is henotheism. Then there's dualism. This is a belief in two eternal and equal forces in conflict, with one being good and the other bad, uh, usually with the belief that the good force will win. Uh, you can think of Star Wars, for example. Uh, that does a good job of kind of, you know, I see that picture of Yoda there, kind of uh, describing what this view is. Monism is a belief that one principle is our guide to all reality. This is more of a philosophy, but it's reducing all of reality to one principle that guides our life. And so, uh, pantheism is a monistic religion that says all is God. God is reality. 
And so all of reality is re reduced to this belief that, that the entire creation, the entire universe is God. Now, this is best reflected in Hinduism that asserts all things in the universe are one and manifest the divine. And so we're to embrace this harmonious life, both equally and together as one humanity. Uh, my challenge with this view is it's so inclusive, it's, it's so tolerant that it makes it hard for me to grasp and define what they believe uh, to mark the line between what is and what is not Hinduism. Now, a similar one to pantheism is panentheism, panentheism, and that's a belief that God exists in and through all creation, but it's still greater than and distinct from creation. This is a kind of spirituality that James Cameron put on display in his movie Avatar, where God is so imminent that he exists in and through it all, being connected to and changed by the creation. Uh, and yet, in that view, God is still uh, distinct as well. That's how it's different from uh, pantheism. And then finally, uh, there's monotheism, which is a belief in one God. That's where uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, uh, they express this belief. And so after highlighting this list of options, in a sense, in the world, how do we respond? And specifically as Christians, I think of the division in our world, we need to do a better job of, of having a conversation. Well, Paul challenged the church to watch our life and doctrine closely. So we need to be diligent and to be well prepared to know what we believe, to engage in conversation with our multi-faith world, because all of these views of God, these beliefs in a divine being or a force or in multiple gods, they don't assert the same truth claims. We're not all saying the same thing. So, for example, when we die, we either go to heaven or hell, we get reincarnated, or we're in the grave. We can't do them all. You know, think about uh, hearing how Hindus uh, believe in God, but he's more impersonal. Uh, but for Christians, God is extremely personal. That's the characteristics of who he is. So these are foundational differences. And so we need to avoid divisive dialogue that pushes people away. And instead, we need to move through our differences, not stopping short of them, not going around them, not avoiding a hard conversation so that we move into honest and open dialogue together to be a testimony of our beliefs. But what does that look like for us today in a multi-faith world? I believe that Paul gives us a good example in Acts 17, how to do this in our multi-faith context. That's where he was in Athens. Uh, we see how he was well-trained as a Roman citizen to engage society by quoting their philosophers, their poets, and their religious beliefs. So we see that here, this Bible verse that says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's from a poet. So he's quoting their literature, their cultural language, that they would best receive and understand because he's reaching them. And so he wants to translate his beliefs into a language that they can receive and understand. Uh, and then you see how <clears throat> when he enters the city, though, he is grieved that he sees all of these idols. And, and so he's disagreeing on an, on an emotional, a personal level. This isn't just intellectual for him. It's deep to him. And, and he sees people's humanity because of that. And at the same time, when he's looking at these idols, uh, look at what he said. He says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So he's, he's leaning in. For as I walked around, looked carefully, respectfully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So he says, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. He's, he speaks truth. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So I, I love that example because Paul used their understanding of God, their belief in an idol, to build a bridge into an open discussion with them. He didn't devalue their beliefs, and he did not change his own convictions. But he went through his convictions into an open discussion with them. And it's so that he could share not only his belief in God and how he's dis distinct, but how he's significant for them to consider. And so if you'd like more of this kind of approach to a multi-faith response and a dialogue, uh, my professor's book, Connecting Christ, How to Discuss Jesus in a 
World of, of Diverse Paths. Uh, he wrote this with his friends who are leaders of other faith traditions and religions because he wants them to explain in their own words what they believe. And then my professor would explain from his Christian view, uh, worldview, how to respond. And so that we as Christians can do a better job to invite conversation about our distinctions and how we believe differently from other people. And it's so that we can share about our belief and listen to theirs, but sp speak significantly and personally into uh, their faith tradition. Now, as we think about this within Christianity, just as there's multiple or alternative views of God throughout the world, so too within Christianity itself, there's a range of perspectives on a belief of God from the Bible. Now, I want to frame this uh, beginning with the two furthest extremes, uh, which is Christian fatalism or a belief that God has power beyond humanity to control everything they and that we do. And then on the other extreme is Christian liberalism, which believes that God gave us control to guide everything we do. And so God is essentially uninvolved in our world. Now, it's within these extreme positions then that we have a more traditional view of God that's called classical theism. I want to look at that one there. <clears throat> that is the belief that God is perfect, whole, he's one, he never changes, he's unaffected by the events around him, he's independent of creation. He's not bound by time, has unlimited power, and knowledge of all things past, present, and future. And so the evangelical Christian movement that's about, you know, proclaiming the good news, about the authority of scripture, about uh, Jesus as our salvation, this is including churches that would identify with Calvinist beliefs, like, you know, you think about Reformed Baptists or uh, Arminius, uh, that are like the Methodist tradition, uh, they can both hold on to this view. Now, on the other side, <clears throat> more of a progressive view of God is this contemporary movement of process theology. And this is from theologians like Charles Hart Shorn. Uh, I think he's more of a philosopher, but uh, and then John Cobb. And they teach this process theology. And this is where God has two natures, and is involved in the processes of our world. So in terms of two natures, what this means is that God embodies the good in sometimes opposing characteristics. So for example, it would say that there's good in being just and merciful, in being transcendent and imminent, in having absolute power, and in leading by persuasion. And then in terms of being involved in the world, this means God is very adaptive, responding to the world that is changing. And so God is bound by time, interdependent upon the universe, and cannot know the future. Now, this contemporary view of God was wrestling through and trying to better explain the problem of evil in the world, where a good God exists, engages with, and loves his creation. And so this contemporary movement spurred other theologians like Greg Boyd and John Sanders to further evolve the conversation to what became open theism. I remember these conversations in, in the 90s especially. This is where God's relationship to the world is open-ended or unforced, making the future contingent on human freedom and making God adapt to or change to human activity. Now, again, they were trying to better explain evil in the world and so their solution was how God responds to human choice and to ensure that God was not the author of evil because they placed it entirely on the responsibility of humanity. Now, with all that is there, you know, how do we make sense of this range of views for our Christian God? Uh, well, there's a tension, just to kind of frame this, there's a tension between our perspective of God and then God's perspective of us. We believe the scriptures give us a perspective of life from God's view of his creation. And as a result, the scriptures are to reshape our perspective of God and ourselves from his perspective. Now, the challenge is that our finite understanding can't fully grasp all of that which is infinite. Being created in God's image, we can know much of God, but even so, there's limits. 
And so as contemporary theologians continue to seek better answers on God's involvement in this broken world, you know, looking at hard questions like, why does a loving, wise, all-powerful God allow suffering in our world? I've wrestled through that. I've written on that. If you'd like to read that, let me know. Uh, the question, if God is able to do anything, then why doesn't he make it easier for us today to just see him, right? We need to hold the tension between God's sovereignty over our world and his active involvement in our world. And remember, this is a theological tension due to our limited perspective of God as finite beings. We are creatures. And so this is not a problem for us to solve, even though it can leave us with answers to these important questions that feel inadequate uh, or insufficient. And, and so we keep learning, we keep growing and challenging ourselves. But with that said, I want to bring some clarity to this conversation about God by defining terms, not limiting God, but, but helping us understand his identity, his purpose, and explaining you know, what these terms mean and then looking at the implication of these beliefs. I think that's so important is not just to know what it is, but what does it mean? And so let's start by looking at the scriptures that give us perspective about God from his view of creation. And so let's first look on his sovereignty. And then we're going to look at his providence, his involvement, his care in creation. Now, they, they're not so distinct. There is some overlap, but I'm trying to take it from those perspectives, God's perspective from his sovereignty and then his providence. And so his sovereignty as the sole creator of the world who is dependent on no other being for existence, God is sovereign, which speaks to his authority. And so he exercises control over his creation to accomplish his purposes. That's the first thing. We're talking about him accomplishing his purposes. Now, this means God has total control, stemming both from his unfailing, wise, and good purposes. And so he knows best. And from his unlimited power. So he's supreme. And so God always has the ability to do what he purposes and according to his character of love and justice. But that does not mean that God literally controls everything in the sense of, of determining. It doesn't mean that human beings are just robots. That's what I'm saying. Again, we're talking about his authority over creation. Now, let's look at some of the scriptures that inform this view. This is the evidence that shapes this belief. You see it in Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1 and 2. God is a creator of all things, all life. Psalm 138, it talks about how God knows all and knows all events. Uh, Isaiah 45, 7, this is where God creates and therefore permits disaster. Now, it's speaking of physical calamity. Uh, it's not saying that he created moral evil. God did not create evil. It's just that he's working within our creation, which was broken by humanity, but he's allowing these things to happen. It's a hard truth. Uh, in Acts 2.23, 4.28, and then Proverbs 16.23 and 16.9, it speaks of how God determines activity in, in little things and, and in big, big things. And then finally, in Romans 1.24, this is where God allows human choice because, again, being the source of life, even our freedom— or our independence comes from and is dependent on God's authority. This is why the tension between God's sovereignty and mankind's free will is a tension between God's authority and our responsibility, because we are not autonomous of God or creation. Uh, otherwise, we'd be self-sufficient. We're not. Uh, we are not independent of God, but we're dependent on him and his creation. Now, as an aside, what this means in terms of my view of God, and just so that you know how I'm coming from, where I'm coming from, I lean towards the classical theistic position with this commitment to God's transcendent sovereignty, and I'm wrestling through the progressive views of God because I clearly see how God as Jesus engaged our broken world and how God is sovereignly interacting and engaging personally with humanity today. So I believe, though, God is powerful and able enough to maintain his nature without being changed by human decisions. And so that's where I draw the line that uh, God has the power, has the ability to maintain him himself uh, without 
uh, human decisions affect. And we'll get in, we'll get into that more. But just to give you my theological framework and where I'm coming from in this conversation. And so this is looking at God's purpose, his sovereignty towards his purpose. Now we're going to look at his sovereignty as it looks at kind of his relationship to provision for, for life. And so as the sole creator of the world, who is the source of all life, God works in and through his creation. And so he exercises control over his creation, not only to accomplish his purpose that we just looked at, but to sustain life. Uh, you see this in Hebrews 1, 3, that Jesus as God sustains all things by his powerful wor word. Uh, Colossians 1, 17, man, I go to that a lot, how God is holding all things together uh, in Jesus. And uh, Matthew 5, 45, that says God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteousness, uh, righteous and the unrighteous. You know, it really describes how God is actively causing the daily rhythms of our world to occur uh, in, the, in the environment, you know, the weather patterns and the sun. And so what does this mean for us, though? <clears throat> well, I think uh, what it means is, first, the free act of God, whereby he brought forth the universe, the whole universe out of nothing, both what is invisible and visible. This means that God willingly entered creation to work within history and time. And not as part of creation, but distinct from and over his creation. So he's still uh, transcendent uh, as much as he's in and involved. There's that distinction. And then he did this freely, not out of necessity as if he was lonely, but as an overflow of his communal relational nature who wants to be known uh, by his creation, which we'll get into that later when we talk about the Trinity. Now, God, who is responsible for uh, and cares for his creation, he takes responsibility. And it's from his wise and good purposes to maintain the things he has made. We, we looked at that already in Matthew 5, 45, how God works concurrently with the natural law that he established, that God causes the sun to rise. He sends rain down. But not only that, God may also directly and supernaturally intervene in the created order as well. And so here is some more evidence we find in scripture for that, such as in Genesis 26, where God supernaturally acts to prevent something from happening. Uh, in Acts 14, 16, where God provided rain and food to cause people to take notice of him. Uh, in Job 1, 12, where God supernaturally restricted the activity of certain people, which for Job meant that God even permitted Satan to affect him in specific ways. So, so we've looked at God's sovereignty now and how he exercises control over and is, is even involved in creation to accomplish his purpose and to sustain life. So what? Okay, well, a difficult outcome from uh, a sovereign understanding of who God is, that he's sovereignly involved in creation is how God being all-knowing of what is past, present, and future, how he made plans for creation before the foundation of the world. And so this means God has predestined or determined activity on earth before it occurred in our world today. Now that seems to conflict with mankind's uh, freedom of choice. The key scripture is Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 12. And it really directly speaks of this. You also see this in Romans 8. And so this view of God is, is necessary. It's important because think of it this way. The purpose is this. Sinful humanity resists God's plan of redemption, which must be accomplished for God's good purpose to be realized in creation. So the point of this belief is that God's power is stronger than anything in all of creation that attempts to resist him including mankind, which you understand with him being the sole source of life. <clears throat> now, how do we make sense of this, though? Well, I believe that a way to understand this is that we trust God's eternal plan. It's based on his wise and good purpose of his will. And so God will work in creation to put us in situation that he knows would result in what needs to happen for all of creation to be restored to his uh, original good intent for us. 
Now, with that said, it can sound good and still be hard. And as we reflect on this, we are finite. We are creatures. God is infinite. He's the creator. And so this is a mystery. And, and really, as we try to explain it, it's going to be a challenge. And, and so in the end, we see it from our limited human perspective. And that doesn't mean it's something that we should give up on trying to explore or understand. It doesn't mean it's a contradiction. It's just a tension that we got to hold. And, and it's, a, it's a tension of a spiritual reality that is difficult to resolve. And so with that said, this is what I see. We believe that God is sovereign over us. That's his authority. He's giving us a level of freedom that he allows for us. And God is also actively involved in a world, you know, exercising his authority, which means that he will intervene as needed to ensure he will accomplish his good purpose for us. But he's not going to interfere with our responsibility to act in this world. And so that's the tension that we have to hold. Now, in light of God's perspective, let's look at how an understanding of God reshapes an understanding of our view of ourselves and this world. And so as we consider our view of God from our perspective, a key part to this discussion is to be clear and, and define what level of freedom humans have in relation to a sovereign and loving God. Now, this topic as Americans is very personal. And so we really need to have a level of of humility and grace as we process this together. Now, there's there's more or less three views. Some argue that freedom is an illusion. Everything is determined by God. This is that fatalist kind of view. Others argue a freedom of contrary choice where God does not impose his will on human relationships at all. Uh, and then within these two extreme views is the compatibilist view where the freedom of choice is made within and according to our nature. So for me, human beings are made in the image of God and reflect a God who uh, acts consistently according to his nature. And so I hold to this compatib compatibilist view that humans make choices that are consistent with their nature. And so you could say that's more of a Calvinistic leaning. Uh, I would say that it's a, it's a good uh, explanation of the revelation that we have in scripture, there is tension. I think when we put those categories on things like Calvinism, Arminianism, we kind of lose kind of the opportunity to discuss and look at the scriptures together. So that's why I resist that. But just to kind of put categories to these, it's more of a Calvinistic view. Uh, libertarian is more of an open, open theism view and Arminianist view. But this means, I believe that God does not change his mind as we read in Numbers 23, 19. He sa it says, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And so God is unlike mankind in that he, he acts consistently according to his good character and promises for us. Now, you might be asking yourself, so what? Man, we are, we are in the details. We are defining freedom very specifically. Well, I want to highlight four things that are really important as we kind of bring this from a human perspective, you know, looking at God's sovereignty. Well, <clears throat> first, this means a few things for us as human beings. Amidst the tension between man's responsibility and God's authority, we hold to God's sovereignty because he is our creator. He's our source of life. Yet, God's sovereign authority over creation does not mean he has the freedom of unlimited choice to do whatever he wants on earth, because even God cannot choose contrary to his good nature. So there are things God cannot do because his freedom is defined. I'm not saying he's limited. His freedom is defined by his nature, by his character of love and justice. So for example, we see in James 1.13, God will not tempt us with evil. He won't do that. Uh, God will not lie. We see that in Hebrews 6. 19. So God uh, does not have freedom of unlimited choice to do whatever he wants. He, he operates within his character of, of, of love and justice. Okay. Now, the second thing is that God is a creator of all life, but he is not the creator of sin. <clears throat> God created humanity 
who had the freedom to choose contrary to God's moral will. We'll get into that. Okay. We sinned. We disobeyed God. And then sin entered our world, producing death and evil in our world. It wasn't God. So God is good and evil is bad. Now, I recognize with God being all-knowing, there's, there's tension there. There's questions there. But I think God is good. Evil is bad. It's, it's that, I make it that simple for my kids. And I need to make it simple for me. And our good God has a plan to restore our broken world he loves. But until then, God does not promise an easy life. However, he does provide good in the heart of life, which means ultimately God wants our good. And so we can seek his grace, we can ask for his help, we can expect his help, finding joy, which means grace recognize that we see his gifts amidst the pain and suffering in our world, recognizing those gifts and celebrating God's goodness to us amidst the hard. God is a creator of all life, but not sin. Third, God consistently hates sin and evil, so there are consequences. Okay, as our sovereign authority over us, and because of God's good character, he is a just God because he consistently hates sin and evil, and he loves goodness and righteousness. And so there are consequences for the evil done by the humanity God loves. However, God also acts consistent with his promise in Jeremiah 18 to relent from his consequences if people change and turn from evil to choose God. Now we see this best in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. It's when God relented from judgment as a whole city repented and turned to God. Furthermore, the other good news is our loving and sovereign God took the consequence of evil on himself in Jesus. And it's so that we can have a loving relationship with God and so that God can still enforce the consequence of evil as a just God being consistent to his standard of justice. So that means God's authority is good, it's reliable, it will prevail. Now, the last thing of what this means to us, understanding man's freedom in relation to God's sovereignty, God does not force his moral will upon humanity, okay? And a free will does not mean God loses his authority over creation. God is still sovereign over. God allows humanity a level of freedom to choose contrary to his moral will but never contrary to his sovereign will. And so God's plan of redemption will be accomplished. That's his sovereign will. And regardless of whether or not humanity chooses to follow God. Now we see this distinction of a sovereign and a moral will in Ephesians. It's uh, in Ephesians 1.11, where it talks about God's sovereign will, that all things work towards God's sovereign will to accomplish his plan of redemption for humanity by the work of Jesus. So humanity can't change this. God's plan of redemption will happen. We know the end of the story. However, in Ephesians 5.17, we see that God wants us to understand the will of the Lord, which in context is his moral will. The beginning of Ephesians talks about his plan, his predestination, his sovereignty. In the latter part of the book, it gets at the application, how we live. And so it's, it's about his moral will, which he revealed to us through the scriptures, specifically the commands that tell us what kind of life he wants us to live, in which he expects us to follow, he expects us to obey, to listen. But that's our choice to do so or not to do so. Now, there's a lot more we could say on this topic. I think a good resource is Four Views on Divine Providence. You can see the authors there. Uh, they give a good uh, perspective from the different ways I've described. Uh, it's going to look at the different views, the assumptions behind God's caring provision for his people as he guides them on their journey of faith, and then how he accomplishes his purpose in and through them. Uh, it does a good job drawing out the you know decisive issues that you need to understand behind the debate. Now, as we conclude on the different views within Christian theism, we need a lot of humility and grace. And it's to, so that we can have fruitful conversations together where we really listen to understand others and, and that we're speaking truth. We're not holding back, but with love and grace. And so let's hold this tension that God is sovereign over his creation, that God can and has intervened in creation, that God allows 
humans a level of freedom, which I describe as, as them being able to choose contrary to his moral will, but never contrary to his sovereign will. And so we may disagree on this. And I think as a church, we have to remember that Christians agree on far more than they disagree on. And so let's focus on what unites us, which is Jesus. And it's so that we can also learn from each other, you know, looking at the scriptures together, trusting in Jesus, and, and really believing in him to work this through his church. And so let's follow the advice of St. Augustine, who once said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And so I believe the authority of scripture, uh, salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, and a triune God, that's the essentials. And so as we kind of talk about these tensions, we need to have a lot of grace and not let this divide us as Christians. Now, after summarizing the scope of beliefs, the different beliefs about God in the world and within Christianity, I want to focus in and, and now look at, after all of that kind of background, defining God for us. This isn't to limit him. Uh, we, don't, we don't limit him. He's revealed himself in the scriptures. And because of that, I want to know God as he is and not as we want him to be. And especially not as a distorted image our world has made him to be. And then as we study God, we need to, like Paul, recognize the complexity, the mystery, and, and let it cause us to worship God. I love after he gets into this tension in Romans 9 through 11, he concludes in worship. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? You know, I just think that's how we should respond in worship to God. In the end, I hope that this causes us to worship God by encountering him as he is in the splendor of his majesty, his glory. And, and it's because worship is, is due our God and his greatness. And so let's continue with that as we look at the scriptures to really know God as it's revealed to us. And, and so as we start this, the, the study in the Bible of who God is, is rightly uh, begun with a study of the names of God. Because especially in the Old Testament, a person's name was seen not just as a title, but as a description of, of their characteristics as a person. And so a study of the divine names of God gives us specific insight into God's being and character. And then it shapes our expectations that we relate with him in that way. And it's as he's revealed to us. And so the primary names of God are Elohim and Yahweh. Now, Elohim literally means strong one. And it's it's very common. It's uh, 2,570 times in the Old Testament alone. So it's used a lot. It's uh, what's in Genesis 1 when he created. And uh, the word functions as an unspecified divine title that is utilized by many other religions and is to introduce a particular deity. Okay. So it's a title. And Elohim speaks of God's transcendence and his authoritative relationship to the whole world because it recognizes that this is the God of the world. And it's it's a world that recognizes that spiritual beings exist and in and, and which we believe that our God of the Bible is supreme. He is Elohim. Now, in contrast, Yahweh is the personal name of God. And so this was explained to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. And he says, I am that I am, which is to say God is present. He's faithful. He's seen in relationship to Israel. And it's as God's deliverer of his special covenant people. And it's it's the people that he's committed to and that he knows personally. And so one way to understand this difference is if you imagine that your father was the president of the United States, Elohim would be like his title president, which is official. It sounds authoritative. Uh, however, as your parent, you would refer to him as dad, which is kind of the personal, what's well, not kind of, it is the personal uh, name for your parent. And it's to show that you're connected in relationship together. And so this is how God's character is revealed to us in the Bible. It's requiring both our respect for his sovereignty over all the nations, but at the same time, still functioning with us like a dad who knows us and cares for us personally. I mean, that's incredible. 
He's both over us as God, and he's with us as a father who loves us. Now, with this background, oftentimes these primary names of God, Elohim and Yahweh, are blended with descriptions to further explain how God more specifically relates with us within those uh, an understanding of what Elohim is a title. It's more transcendent. Yahweh is personal. It's, it's more about his presence. <clears throat> and so the singular form of Elohim is El. And so we're going to see how uh, it's followed by a more transcendent description of him. So, for example, El Roy, it's how God sees us. And not just how he sees us, it's how God has a personal awareness of us and is also how he's allowed us to see him. And, and so that's the first. Then there's El Shaddai or Almighty God, which comes from the Hebrew word for mountain. It describes, you know, his power, his strength, his durability. Then there's El Elom or everlasting God. It describes his, his, um, uh, his, uh, let me just go to the story. So it's used uh, just before the test by God with Isaac on Mount Moriah, and it was to speak of Abraham's basis for a confident hope that God could raise his son from the dead if necessary, because he's eternal, he's everlasting. So it speaks of kind of that resurrection hope. <clears throat> okay, and then you have El Elyon, that God is supreme. And so these are kind of the, the transcendent names of God. Now for the more personal descriptions that are associated with Yahweh, there's one where God is the provider. And that's used to describe the sacrificial lamb that was personally given as a substitute for Isaac. This is in Genesis 22, verses 13 and 14. Or there's Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, which described God in Exodus 17, 15, when Moses defeated the Amalekites. And a banner was used by God's people to point to their army. And so it's really cool. It's this great uh, understanding that it's like saying that God's name points to an army that follows and protects his people. So that's that protection. Or Yahweh Shalom means the Lord is my peace. That's from Judges 6, verses 12 to 24, when Gideon received comfort, affirmation, and forgiveness from God for accepting his sacrifice to God. Now, you might be asking, you know, so what? I just think it's so important, you know, why does this matter? How does this help us in our relationship to God? Well, it's interesting Jesus in Luke 11, 1 through 4, he said, when we pray, we first praise a name of God, which means to adore and admire who God is as revealed in the Bible, and then how he personally and authoritatively relates to us in his creation. So we're to praise God, and we're to begin our prayers and worship by declaring God's character and how he, as my, as our sovereign and personal God, is so important to us and, and someone who we adore. And so, for example, uh, I may voice how God sees me in this moment, right here, in this moment. And so I'm so grateful he, he knows me that well and knows what I'm going through. Or I may declare that God is all-powerful, how he's able to do more than we ask or imagine, beyond expectation. And so I praise him for having the strength and the resources to help me. You know, also, I think about prayer as applied theology. It's, it's how we express our relationship to God. And so as we study the names of God, it really helps us improve how we pray by worshiping him, worshiping God as he is, as he's revealed to us. And then this is how Jesus prompts us to pray to him by really posturing our heart in submission to God as sovereign, as over us, as our father. Now, with all that said, reflecting on all the different views of God in the world within Christianity Looking at the names of God, how would you define who God is? How would you synthesize all this together to define God in like a sentence or less? What would be an accurate definition for the Christian God? Well, according to the Westminster Catechism that had a, a couple versions in the 1700s, really thoughtful summary of our Western Christian doctrine from the Church of England, they said God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now, I agree with this definition, 
but also recognize how it's more of a traditional view of God. So we want to give an accurate definition that is distinctly Christian, but that allows for the scope of contemporary perspectives, which we discussed earlier. And so if we were to focus on what is essential to know about God, what are his core qualities or attributes that define him as revealed in the scriptures, what would they be? Well, I believe this. The essential character characteristics of God, the core to who he is, is this. God is one, which means he is the ultimate God of all spiritual beings. So when you think about angels and demons, that's what I mean. Um, you know, even humans having a spiritual nature to us, having a soul. He is supreme with no rivals. And so he's the only creator of all life. Now, another aspect is he's personal, which means God is known and draws close to his creation. That's key. He, he draws near. He's intervening and he's interacting with us. And he's wanting to be known in relationship to us. And then that leads us into him being triune. Why does he want relationship? It's because he's communal in nature, uh, being three equally valuable persons, but each with a different function in relationship to each other and to us. We're going to get into that in a second. And then finally, spirit, which means God is distinct from his creation. He exists beyond the physical world, being independent and set apart in a non-physical spiritual domain. So that's how I would define who God is. And if you're interested, we did a, a series on this at Anthem Church last summer and got into this. So I can make that available to you if, if you're interested. Now, this also means the essence of God's primary characteristics can be framed in two important and distinct categories. God's transcendence, that's him being spirit and one. And then God's presence, that's him being personal and triune or communal. Now, in doing this, this highlights our tension of knowing the Christian God who is both set apart and distinct, but he's also engaged in interacting personally with us. And, and it means that some of who God is will be relatable and some of who God is will not be relatable to us. So let's look at that together. What are his relatable characteristics? He's intelligent or he's able to know all of what is actual and potential. <clears throat> I think about his relational capacity to know and be known, his uh, morals, his ability to hold what is good and true which implies how God is trustworthy and reliable. There's his sovereignty, his authority over us, having both the will and the power to impose his will on us. And then finally, it's his personality, his, his emotions, his ability to feel and be emotional like us. For example, God was grieved. We see that in Genesis 6. He was angry. We see that in Psalm 95. Uh, he was jealous. We see that in Exodus 20. It's a, the sense that the none greater than God. And so it's, it's a holy jealousy. But all of this to say, the Christian God draws near to humanity by being personable and relatable to us. In contrast to this, there's his incommunicable or his characteristics that we can't relate to. And so there's some of who God is that is beyond us, and, and, and that creates the mystery. And so <clears throat> we can't partake of them. This is unique to God alone. might be difficult to grasp. So first, there is a self-existence where God is a source of life. He's not caused by anyone. He's not dependent on any other being for existence. Uh, John 1.3 says it best, all things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. This implies that everything apart from God was created at a point in the past by God, which is kind of profound to think about. So God is the only source of life. Uh, second is his immutability. immutability. He's unchanging. He doesn't change his nature. We talked about that. He's responsive to our needs according to his will. Yet, as mentioned previously, God is unlike mankind. He responds consistently with his nature and his divine promises. Uh, then God is infinite. He's without limits. Now, this is different from how we are bringing definition to God. It's so that we can know him as he's known, his identity. <clears throat> it's kind of like a picture has lines to distinguish the outline. And so that's what an identity definition does, <clears throat> is to give it contour and shape to know him. 
and he's infinite, which has to do more with how God is not limited by space and time. And so he's all knowing, he's always present, and he's all powerful. Now, the last one, he's eternal, he's timeless. Time is part of space, matter, time, it's part of the creation. And so God created time, he's independent, he's outside of time, he existed before it, he doesn't decay, he doesn't age, which is really hard to imagine. But you might be asking yourself again, so what? Why does this matter? Well, think of it in terms of us being made in the image of God. This helps us relate with God because humanity is God's unique representative on earth who's made in his image. And so we are similar to God in personality, morality, relational capacity, and having an authority over creation. And that's to cultivate, bring out goodness out of creation, to subdue and care for the earth. And then in terms of being divine, we are unlike God in his incommunicable attributes, the things that are beyond us, like him being self-existent, eternal, unchanging. You know, we as believers enter into uh, um, eternity because of God. That's him as the source. But humans aren't transcendent in nature. We're able, we're not able to exist above and independent of creation like God. We are very dependent so we have limits, and that's what huma humility means, that we understand a view of ourselves from God's perspective, that we have limits, and we need to understand those boundaries to live well and healthy and good lives. And this is to live as God created us to live, it is according to his personality, his morals, his relational expectations, his, his desire for us to care for the earth. Okay. Significant to our understanding of the Christian God is explore what makes him distinct. This is our last topic to look at together. So good job hanging in there. There's a lot to cover. Literally hours of lectures and notes and reading, trying to condense it into as short of a meaningful amount of content as possible. And so I want to look at the distinct triune nature of God. And so this is our final, in some ways, most important topic in our exploration of a belief in the Christian God, because to see God as triune means he engages us in three persons, not one God who, by the way, is three persons, but rather how the father abides in the son, how the son abides in the father, how the spirit is in communion together, which is to say how they're all one participating simultaneously as a Trinitarian God in relationship together. So God is communal in nature, which means in a sense, that without Jesus and the Holy Spirit, God the Father would remain distant, transcendent, over creation, and it would result in an insurmountable gasp, gap for a finite humanity to, to really know and be known by their infinite God. However, God revealed himself to us by drawing near in the person of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the eternal, powerful unchanging God who spoke creation into existence, this God came to earth and revealed the triune nature of God in and through the person of Jesus, who in turn gave us the Holy Spirit so that those who trust in Jesus can commune and, and know our triune God. This means God does not have a relational characteristic as much as his very being is relational. And Jesus, who being in his very nature is a relational God, he demonstrated to us how God in perfect communion with one another as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that, that there is a relational experience we have with God as a triune God. And so with all that said, I want us to close by defining what the Trinity is, what it does, and then what we can expect. Okay, so the modern definition of the Trinity is, I think, best expressed from B.B. Warfield. And it says this, there's one and only one true God, but in the unity of the Godhead, there are three eternal co-equal persons, the same in substance, but distinct in subsistence. So distinct in function. Now, the term Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the concept is. And so it is our responsibility as Christians to wrestle through the scriptures to determine whether the biblical evidence is sufficient to support this belief. This is what happened with the early church. We're going to look at that briefly. And it's 
from that discussion of the early church that this term emerged after they experienced literally centuries of controversy discussion of this important topic. So let's look at kind of four key points in the discussion that the church had, the debate that the early church had. So started with Gnosticism, which is essentially a belief that the material world is evil and the spiritual world is good. It's kind of this dualistic thinking. And so this erroneous thinking implied that God in heaven was spiritual, but with the world being evil, then with that thinking, Jesus could not have been human, but rather it was only a manifestation. Otherwise, he would have been evil. And then that would have made him impersonal. So Jesus could not have been human with Gnosticism. Then second, the debate led the way to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, 300 years. And Tertullian first used the word Trinity to explain how Jesus was the same essence of God, but was distinct in nature. So he's trying to avoid the charge of tritheism or three gods where Jesus would become inferior, uh, not totally equal with God the Father, but sub subordinate to God the Father as a created being. He didn't want that. And so as an aside, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, their faith tradition believes uh, this, and which is why I would not say that they believe in the Christian God. They do reference scripture, but they do not say it is an essential for us to believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Now, from that point with Tertullian, then it led to the Council of Nicaea when the church officially recognized uh, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, his divinity and humanity. And so this resulted, though, in a growing division in the church where the East was saying Jesus was of similar substance to God, the Father, and the West was saying that Jesus is the very essence or substance of God, the Father. So eventually the Council of Constant Constantinople settled the debate, but it wasn't until the Council of Toledo in 589 AD, so that's after Christ's relationship to God the Father had been defined, that's when in 589 AD the Holy Spirit was recognized as a third co-equal eternal member of the Godhead. Wow, what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that key in this discussion is Jesus. And it makes sense because there is inherent theological tension in God being a man, fully God, fully man. Yet again, this is a mystery. It's not a contradiction. Jesus is not a contradiction. He's God and he's man. It's a mystery. And it's a significant distinction of the Christian faith. And so think about how, man, the church literally wrestled through this for over 500 years. And so let's make sure we take a humble approach to this discussion and do the work, learning from history, looking at the scriptures. And that's what we're going to look at uh, together. And it's it's so that when we make statements about this, that there's a humility to our posture. Okay, what's the support in the scriptures for the Trinity? Well, the first time we see the plurality of God is in Genesis 1, 26, when God said, let us make man in our image. And just as an aside... Uh, this is where he said that he made male and female. And so God's greatest creation wasn't a human being. It was community, man, man and woman together. So it speaks of God's um, communal nature. Now, later in John chapter one, he began his gospel account by retelling the creation story in Genesis. You can read it, chapter one. And he explained how the triune God was there with God as the creator and Jesus as the creator's spoken word. And so Jesus was there at creation. And then as you read in Genesis, you can see that the spirit's hovering over the waters. And so the Trinity is there at creation. And then as you read through the writings of John, he further elaborates on the significance of the communal nature for, of God for us. Uh, let's look at 1 John. This is 4, 13 to 16. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit, and we've seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, so there's the Trinity. And I, I love this because the text literally says that we have the love of the Trinity flowing through us with Christ living in us, the Spirit empowering us, and the Father residing in us. That's incredible. 
And it speaks the relational nature of God who's overflowing with his love for us by forming a real spiritual relationship. Now, the best scriptural support of the Trinity in the Old Testament is Isaiah 48, 6, references two distinct uh, and divine persons in connection with the Spirit, which from my viewpoint is anticipating the New Testament doctrine of the Trinity when Christ comes and, and speaks more specifically into this and, and then the New Testament uh, letters as well. But uh, you see the Trinity here in Isaiah 48, 16. And then as we enter into the Gospels, at the start of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 3, Spirit of God descending and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. And so you see the Trinity there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And then in Matthew 28, you see it at the beginning, really, of, of the disciples being sent out. And so what this says is really the triune nature of God participate in the sending out of Jesus and the church. It's part of the mission. And it's really key to understand God's mission from a triune perspective as well. I've done some writing on that. If you're interested in that, I'm happy to share but it drove the mission of Jesus and his church. Now, the best scriptural support for the, um, the Trinity in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6, which highlights how some believe in many gods, but Paul makes it clear that there is one God, the Father, that there is one Lord, Jesus, who are both the source of life. So there's that Trinity and unity of one being many. Uh then you see John 5, Jesus himself testifies that he understood he was equal with God the Father. You see in 2 Corinthians 3, this one's important because Paul is describing Moses' experience with God's glory and how the Lord or Yahweh that we looked at is the Spirit. So this is significant proof that the Spirit shares the same deity of God the Father by sharing the same personal name of God that was used only of God and himself, that personal name of God. And so with all this said, the scriptures clearly support there's one God, three distinct and co-equal persons. And so let's hold all three in balance. It's when we emphasize one over the other that it leans towards uh, heresy and it's not true as God has revealed it. So we've got to hold this tension, this mystery together. And why does this matter? <clears throat> why does a belief in a triune God matter? What does it do for us? Well, we are created from God's inherent desire for a relationship. We are not created out of necessity. It's from an outpouring of God's communal identity as God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It existed in perfect relationship to each other without us. And so God did not need man to be relational. He is transcendent. He doesn't depend on his creation. However, it's in his nature. And, and it's in his desire, his relational desire for us that he formed us in his image, that the greatest creation was community, man and woman, made in his image. And so two things. One, we find meaning in relationship to God. And so I think about this because just as my kids look to me and their mom to understand more of themselves, we look to God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit to know why we are here, how we're to live, what it means to be human. The other thing is we are relational beings. We're dependent on one another and God, and it is not good for us to be alone. We are made for community, and we're not made for isolation. I understand there's energy that people talk about being extroverted, introverted, but in our core being, we are relational. We need people to understand ourselves, to process life. My counselor would talk about that in terms of we need to verbalize and communicate to understand what we're feeling and thinking. So we are relational beings. We're made or community. And so what can we expect from a triune God? Well, Ephesians 1, 3 to 13 is the best place to look for this. It's where Paul writes a letter to new Christians, and it's so that they understand what it means to be in Christ. And that's his description of being a Christian. And one thing I love is how he opens this letter by celebrating how God's blessings are open to all. He's, he's not getting into a debate. He's worshiping God, for those who trust in Jesus, these are the blessings that you can receive. And so Paul's view of God immediately causes him to worship God, uh, which is a good reminder for us, again, that we're, we're not to get too lost in the debate, what we can't explain. Instead, we're to worship God in the mystery. And, and we know him and he's beyond knowing. Now, Paul then explains more about three specific blessings 
that Christians receive from our triune God, starting with God the Father's blessing of being chosen. This means that being a Christian is not an accident. It is not based on our merit. And so much so that God chose us before creation existed. And I know that's to say uh, it's difficult to understand, but it's God is that strong. And, and he's interested in bringing us into his family that much. Now, some debate over this. How did God predestine us? What does it mean for, you know, we looked at that, freedom to choose. The reality is that our broken world creates doubt in us. We can struggle to believe, are we chosen? And are we good enough to be part of God's family? And so this belief essentially is there for us to remember that God is a source of our relationship in him. And I think of this in relation to my, my daughter who we adopted. There's no debate whether or not she's a valid family member that never comes across my mom or my mind. Uh, she is chosen, okay? She is she is part of our family. She's a Peterson. We never question. We never never ask, you know, is she a real member? Silly. We, we're just grateful. We celebrate her as part of our family. And, and that's what's happening here too. We just need to celebrate that we're part of the family. And, and it's a blessing knowing that God chose us. So that's the first blessing. The second blessing, Paul explains the blessing of Jesus who did the work for us. And it's because humanity broke God's good world, and we owed God a, a debt, and God's justice demanded a payment. And so Jesus redeemed, which means paid our debt, and he forgave, which means he's released us from ever paying him back forever. What this means for us is that Jesus took the full cost of our brokenness on himself so that we can have an eternal relationship with God. You know, I think of it this way. When my kids break things at home, it does happen. I fix it and I forgive them. Why? I want a relationship with them. I'll do the work. And I do what it takes. And so Jesus uh, did what it takes for us so that we can have a relation with God. Now, the last blessing that's explained from the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, how he takes responsibility for us. That's the seal. It's this idea of, of kind of uh, an authoritative ownership of, of something. And so the seal of the Holy Spirit in verse 13 meant that we are God's possession. And it's through God's Spirit. He's active in our life. He's working to transform us to become more like uh, Jesus. And I think of it this way with my daughter. You know, we take responsibility for her every day. We show her and everyone that she's part of the family by feeding her, caring for her. It's the same with God. Every day, Holy Spirit's working, taking responsibility for us. And so the Spirit is our daily reminder that God loves us and takes responsibility for our spiritual growth. Now, as we reflect on these blessings, this is what I conclude. All of, the, all of this means this. For those who trust in Jesus, we celebrate this blessing from God. God the Father chose us to be forgiven in Jesus the Son so that we can live for God by the work of the Holy Spirit. God the Father chose us to be forgiven in Jesus the Son so that we can live for God by the work of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Now, I think as we reflect on these blessings, we need to see them as essential. These aren't just options for us. These aren't this, The Trinity isn't just this historical debate, but it's an essential belief in our Christian God, which not only helps us know who God is, but how he relates with us on earth. And as Christians made in the image of God, we are all blessed in Jesus. We are blessed, and we need to see those blessings, how we're invaluable to God how we're chosen with a purpose, not defined by our mistakes, marked by God. And we're released from the control of sin, from our inner failures, from the addictions. We're forgiven. We have a new start at life. And this means we're empowered by the Holy Spirit who's with us, who's doing the work so we can live for God and experience his life-giving relationship. And so this means for us, there is a security in the doctrine of the Trinity as it's related to us and the expectations we have from God based on his word. And so as we look to these truths that we're chosen, we're forgiven, we're empowered by God, and, and through these things that we're growing in relationship to God, we're being changed so that we too may overflow to others with God's love towards us, that we overflow with his love towards others, which we experience because of the Trinity. You know, I love Major Thomas in his book, The Mystery of God Godliness. He describes this he says, all of the Father was available to all of the Son, 
because by his faith love relationship, all the son was available to all of the father and this constituted his perfect manhood. So as we look to Jesus to understand this, that he experienced full communion with God in a love relationship. And so we as relational beings who have the love of the Trinity flowing through us with Christ living in us, with the spirit empowering us and the father residing in us, we have this opportunity to experience the life-giving nature of the Trinity. Major Thomas continued, he said, for godliness is not the consequence of your capacity to imitate God. It's not about us, but it's a consequence of his, his capacity to reproduce himself in you, to restore the marred image of the invisible God. This means God indwells in us fully so that we can fully live the life he designed us to live as his image bearer. It's God's all-powerful love that empowers us to serve as Christ served us, which makes this possible in a broken world. I mean, this is just incredible when you think of the implications of the Trinity and our relational capacity and what God has done for us so that we can know God. And then as we conclude, knowing God helps us to know ourselves. Man, thanks so much for taking the time to explore the depth and the scope of our Christian belief in who God is and what he's done. Thank you for taking the time to listen. You know, remember that knowing God helps us know ourselves. This is fruitful for us. It, it helps us build our relationship to God. It helps us understand how he wants us to live with him, that we are honored by God being made in his image. And so the more we know God, we know, we know how he's made us. And so we grow in our relationship to God and we, we grow in our understanding of ourselves. It's, it's such a gift. And, uh, and I think, too, that our God is not a nameless, faceless God. He became a man known as Jesus so that we can know God as he is, who entered our world to know us and so that we can be known by him. It's remarkable. And uh, so that's where we're going to go in our next video. It's going to focus on the person and work of Jesus how he is fully God, fully man, and, and the implications of that, and, and how does that work, looking at the scriptures and kind of the tensions that we see in that. So you can look forward to that, and I'll look forward to uh, being a part of that with you. Thanks for being a part of this today.